I want to start off by saying what design is, um, not not just as I find that 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 many, particularly in Europe, often think of design as um, you know maybe maybe just the things you see at IKEA or interior decorating or or these kind of things. But we like to think of design in a in a more general sense as the solving of problems. Um, and successful design is indeed solving problems within the constraints which you have to operate in. And even more narrowly, I want to talk today, um, and, it, and it is very similar to some of the things that the, the engineering uh, fact just talked about, um, a, an emerging area of design uh, in which design is placed in the service of society. In the spring of 2004, I was a graduate student at Duke University working on instruments like this designed to image and manipulate objects one billionth of a meter small. This, this area of nanotechnology is one that the United States is now spending $10 billion a year to research, and uh, an amount, incidentally, that's about the same as we spend on plastic surgery. That spring, I joined a US Marine Corps Reserve unit. And less than 48 hours after I swore in, we got the warning order to go to Iraq. By the middle of August, I found myself in Anbar province, where on New Year's Day of 2005, a foot patrol that I was on was ambushed by improvised explosive device. Uh, the explosion that took off my forearm, uh, also killed Lance Corporal Brian Perello. I consider myself extremely fortunate to be here talking to you. Within one week, I was back in the United States, and you can see me and my son here contemplating uh, the, the situation that we found ourselves in. I had an enormous amount to learn about what we as a society could offer uh, people who are missing a limb. What I thought I knew about that uh, turned out mostly to be informed by, by science fiction and by popular press uh, reports of that technology that might as well have been science fiction. And um, as I was going through more surgeries and waiting to uh, get an arm at the Army Hospital myself, I talked to a prosthetist at Duke University named Glenn Hostetter, and um, he, he showed me actually a, a hook somewhat like this and said, well, you know, this is probably um, what, what you're going to get. And I said, oh, no, no, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to get uh, one of these myoelectric prostheses that they have at Walter Reed. And, and, and he, he, he looked at me and he said, well, um, ha have you ever seen one? And, and I said, no, no, no. Um, and, and he said, well, let me show you. And he took me in the back, and he showed me a small child's uh, myoelectric prosthetic hand. And, and my reaction was that, really, that's it? Um, you know, a, a sort of a single degree of freedom device that, that opens and closes like this, and, and not nearly at the speed um, with which this one does. And you know, I, I sort of came to realize that a lot of what prosthetists have to do is manage expectations. <laughs> um, the, the reality, uh, to, to, for me, having tried some of the other ones, uh, the device that I found uh, most effective was, in fact, this hook patented by uh, an amputee named David Dorrance in 1912. And this is the patent drawing that you see up here. And uh, you know, I, I think that you can probably very clearly recognize that it's not too different from, from that device. This is what's called a body-powered prosthetic hook, and it operates um, basically like a clothespin held shut with this rubber band, and it's opened and closed by pulling on a cable attached to my opposite shoulder and allow me to pick something up. Now, this, this device is uh, not, you know, not to say that this device is not effective. Um, but it has been referred to by others talking about this area of technology as a rubber band uh, and a hook on the end of a stick. But, it, but in fact, in the, the hands of a, a user like myself, uh, 
some reasonably impressive things can, can be accomplished. Uh, you may have seen other grape eating videos in the news. But they can't do that. But we can do much better. And uh, as with some other issues that face our society, we must do better. Um, I've all ultimately challenged my energy in this area uh, as a, an engineer and a designer trying to scratch my own itch and solve my own problem uh, into a product project called the Open Prosthetics Project, um, based on my view that uh, an open source, a shared design solution is hopefully the one that will help us overcome the multiple market failure that has stagnated innovation in this area of design for more than a century. My uh, open prosthetics project is part of a growing movement in design in which designers are seeking to serve the, the greater good, uh, to place design in the service of society. Uh, what the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum has described as design for the other 90%, meaning design intended to reach the vast majority of the, the, the world that doesn't benefit from our, our advanced society and the, the products that make our lives better, or at least more complicated. The, a friend of mine uh, calls this using your geek powers for good. Uh, a, there are a couple members of our fac who very eloquently describe this movement at the intersection of design and service as public interest design. Uh, I want to share with you some other examples of this kind of design. This is the Embrace Infant Warmer, uh, designed to, to help uh, heat uh, premature and underweight babies in India and Vietnam. Or this, the D-Light Solar Lantern, designed to provide light for the one in four people in the world who do not have access to electricity. Or this hospital in Butari, Rwanda, um, which is an example of people involved in public interest design, uh, not just of, of things, but buildings, uh, landscapes, and environments. Um, this was designed by the Mass Design Group, um, mobilizing architecture to serve society. Um, we, we have an honored guest here uh, from this project who I hope you take the time to speak with. Designed with uh, Paul Farmer, uh, Partners in Health, uh, the Butari Hospital used local materials, labor, uh, and natural airflow um, to address the spread of tuberculosis in, in the hospital. And they're looking to extend some of the ideas that were used in the design of this hospital uh, to another in Anza, Kenya. And uh, th this, is, this next video I'm gonna show is some short clips uh, the, f from a pilot video that will ultimately uh, be funded by, by Fetzer, um, a, a more full video, but I want you to hear them talk about this project in their own words. Um, this extremely drug-resistant strand emerged in this and every patient that got it died in less than two months. The reason for that is because patients who went into this hospital clearly uh, were waiting in, in settings or, that weren't designed for them to be waiting in. It was the lack of design or the failure of design which uh, actually created this disease or incubated this airborne infection and ended up killing these patients. So this, of course, is a crisis. It's a crisis not only in... Uh, in, in medical facilities, but it's really a crisis of design, that there's direct outcomes for our failure or negligence to be dealing with the potential outcomes of a sick environment. Um, we had a chance to question this in, uh, in a project which uh, was completed last year, the Batara Hospital uh, in northern Rwanda, which we worked on with a group called Partners in Health. Uh, how do we design the facility in such a way that that ward itself can reduce infections or rather not transmit those diseases? So we worked with engineers, at the Harvard School of Public Health to uh, design a facility that actually helps to reduce infection by increasing air changes per hour. In particular, around material choices in the Batara Hospital, we use a local volcanic stone, uh, which became really informative to us about how we could kind of build and train craft development um, through the process of building. Uh, we're gonna reuse that same strategy um, within the Nyanza project as well, um, except using kind of uh, stone and brick that's also available in that community. 
in, in essence, what drives our organization is really the notion that buildings can actually directly heal, not indirectly, but directly. Um, if they're making people sicker, they can also make them healthier. So if the Nianza project is an example of pushing that even further using low-tech strategies and natural sort of systems available to us, um, how can we kind of make that into a sort of entire process for the revamping the entire Ministry of Health's health infrastructure? This type of design can also extend to uh, public services and social systems uh, in service of the public good. Uh, and an example is this in-home sanitation system that's being used in Ghana. In New Orleans, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, students at Tulane University were able to create a space uh, for urban agriculture, uh, entrepreneurship, and social enterprise uh, at a project called GrowDat. And I'll, I'll let you see a video discussing that project. Our youth spend about 50% of their time like in the farm, doing physical labor, growing, doing everything from building the rows you see here to cooking the food or selling it. So they do the whole nine, and that's about 50% of their time. The other 50% of their time is in lessons or like discussions and things of that nature. So we get to like watch them grow and become stronger workers, but we also get to see, um, to have a glimpse inside that personal life. One of our crew members who works here now, he said right after Katrina, he remembered he and his father canoeing through here. With their perspective, and just to see how far it turned around, most of our youth are about um, 16, so they were like 10 years old, you know, nine to like 10 years old when, when Katrina happened. So their memories are very, very vivid. I mean, we've thought a lot about how this project fits into New Orleans post-Katrina. I believe very strongly that the space that Johanna and Leo and their team have created out here fundamentally addresses some of those needs to heal within the young people. The young people in our program, most of them do not have access to spaces like this space, you know? Spaces that are designed with intention, that are built with care, that are beautiful and thoughtful. So for them to be able to come here and feel ownership over a space that is created with such care and quality sends a super clear unspoken message to them. Through that space, we're saying we value you and we expect a lot from you in return. Design uh, with these goals in mind doesn't necessarily need to involve new products or spaces. Um, it could, for example, be this century's old Pueblo uh, in O.K. Wingi, which has been rehabilitated in ways that both honor the, the tradition and the construction uh, and, and improve it so that it can survive uh, for centuries to come. Um, design, in fact, can be a means for love and compassion. We don't talk about love in architecture necessarily, but more importantly, we don't talk about the spirit and we don't talk about culture. You know, the, these are the things that, at least for certain architects, are paramount, but they're very hard to discuss. Um, you know, there's, you know, you, you can't theorize very clearly or articulate very clearly what's important about spiritual values in architecture. But absolutely, that's what drives most of us. And, and so it, it is sort of this underlying thing that it would be wonderful, ha wonderful to have more ability to articulate more often. Her passion and her commitment um, to Oke Winge, not just in this particular project, but from the moment she started working here, has been, you know, acknowledged and accepted. And so that alone, to me, we, to some extent, there, there's some form of love there that, um, you know, the tribe has and Jamie has. Where does the vision actually come from for a community? I hope it doesn't come from a tribal leader only. That it has to come from the members of that community. And if we continue our, our approach, um, the community members will have always input, especially our younger ones. Everywhere you look, in just about every situation that you can imagine,
design has a role to play, and perhaps never more than now. We cannot realize the potential and power of everyday people, including and, and perhaps most importantly the poor, without these folks demanding and expecting good design. And this is easier said than done. In many communities, in war-torn areas like Rwanda, in struggling urban areas like New Orleans that we've talked about before, design can heal and can help foster forgiveness. Design can be a force for good. In order to achieve this, we need a culture shift in the design professions. Now, often, design is a, an expensive and exclusive luxury, uh, and which it shouldn't be. It should be a fundamental right. And public interest design is working to change this. Design can, in fact, advance the common good. It can empower people in communities. And in fact, the people who have the problems that need solving uh, are sometimes the best designers themselves. And we need to both empower them uh, to, to solve these problems themselves and empower them with solutions to these problems. Design can catalyze social change. Uh, it needs, in order to do this, strategic support for creative problem solving. Uh, in order to arrive at the beauty, compassion, democracy, inclusivity, and innovation that design can bring. Love is, in fact, the manifest intention of good design. Uh, we need transformational design initiatives that foster interdependent relationships among people and between them in the designed environment. And this is a favorite of mine. I, I believe that sharing a design is the ultimate act of love in design. The gift of your design, the product of your creativity to the world, giving people the freedom to study change and redistribute that design amplifies the impact of it in the global community. Uh, ensuring, for example, the storm that the movement of the butterfly's wings might bring. Good design endures. Uh, we, we have here a, a gallery of, of designers from all different areas of design that you might recognize and some that you might not. Uh, in the upper right is J.P. Knight, who designed the first traffic light, and which looks almost like the ones that we use today. And uh, Mary Phelps Jacob in the middle left was so dissatisfied with the corsets that she had to wear that she and one of her maids designed the first brassiere. We believe that everybody deserves good design. We recognize that design is the expression of love and forgiveness that energizes and strengthens our global community. In fact, you deserve good design. In order to achieve the impact that we seek in doing all this, we can't just benefit an individual recipient of a project uh, or, an, or an activity. Um, we can't simply look at, at, at our activities in, in isolation uh, and in the change that they might bring about in us in being inspired and talking about these kinds of issues. We need to have an impact that extends further. Uh, we need to act. We need to not just design something. Uh, in the same way I might say, that we don't want to give a fish, but we want to teach to fish. If we empower through design and the dissemination of designs, we might be able to empower millions of fishermen to come up with better solutions for fishing that can be shared with yet millions more, creating a sustainable future for innovation in fishing, but not just in fishing, but in every field. Uh, thank you very much. I invite you to join me in, in trying to carry this out.